Psalm 16, verse 11 says, Vain is the help of man. On the night of April 14, 1912, at 11.40 p.m., the greatest maritime disaster in history took place. The great Titanic, pride of the White Star Fleet and of the United States, ran into an iceberg 800 miles away from the coast of Newfoundland. There were 2,340 souls, all told. 705 were saved, 1,635 perished with the ship. It was her maiden voyage. It had worldwide publicity as not only the world's largest and most luxurious, but also as the safest of all ocean-going craft. Never before had a crew and passengers been so secure. The passengers were world famous. This was a strange time in the history of our country. In those early 1900s, many people do not realize, but we had our jet set then, except we didn't have any jets. There were a group of men in this country that were so unbelievably wealthy that it defies the imagination. Remember, that was before the age of the income tax and the aid and uh, before the age of inflation it was nothing for this group of men to show up at any particular place on earth maybe it was to see some new invention or just to participate in some new thing and so when they heard that this ship titanic which was an unsinkable ship was to sail. They were there to make the maiden voyage. As I said, this was an unusual time in the history of our nation, and there was something ominous about the sailing of the Titanic. It was almost as if They had given notice to God that at last man was the master of his own destiny and the captain of his own fate, and no longer would he fear the elements, for he had, through his own scientific progress, ingenuity, and intelligence, created the unsinkable ship, and now man was to set sail and to defy the elements. As I said, the passengers on that ship were world famous. There was John Jacob Astor, one of the world's most wealthy men, whose fortune was estimated at $150 million. He was returning from a trip to Egypt with his 19-year-old bride. There was Major Archibald Butt, military aide to President Taft, Benjamin Guggenheim of the American Smelting and Refining Company, worth nearly a hundred million dollars, Isidore Strauss, the famous clothier and merchant, worth fifty million dollars, J. Bruce Ismay, International Mercantile Marine Company, worth forty million dollars. The string of his wife's pearls was worth two hundred fifty thousand dollars. It was among the world's finest. These men had no idea that they were taking their last voyage. In every sense of the word, this voyage was fantastic. No ship had ever been the picture of luxury as was this ship. Tennis courts, gymnasiums, ballrooms, even elevators. That was quite something in 1912. Elevators, but not enough lifeboats. 
The best suites were reserved for $4,300 without a private promenade, $2,300. The most expensive transatlantic accommodations ever offered, but not enough lifeboats. The voyage was based on false security. This boat was to be unsinkable. It was the largest afloat, 882 and a half feet long. That's more than four city blocks, anchors weighing 15 and a half tons, just one chain link, 175 pounds. It had a double bottom five to six feet thick to ensure additional safety. There were 15 watertight compartments. No one could imagine an accident that would cause her to founder. It would only be possible if both keel plates and her double bottom were torn away for more than half her length. This was so improbable that it didn't even enter the field of conjecture. There was no ship that ever sailed the seas that gave her passengers more confidence, more cool security. I tell you, they would have called the person a lunatic who would have said by morning two-thirds of the ship's occupants would be lost at sea. And this voyage proved that fact defeats theory. Recently, in an old book copyrighted in 1912, I saw a cartoon. It was a huge ship. On the side of the ship, was the word theory. And looming above the ship, as if it were the Empire State Building, was this huge iceberg. And across that huge chunk of ice was written these wor this word, F-A-C-T, fact. My friends, this voyage did prove that fact defeats theory. Theory said that the ship was unsinkable, but the fact is it could sink if it hit a submerged object in such a manner as to tear away the double bottom for more than half her length. Theory said there were no icebergs in that immediate area. The fact was they were sailing through mushy waters already. Theory said the lookouts on the crow's nest would give ample warning, but the fact is they did give warning, but to no avail. I don't know where the men who were supposed to be in that area were. Maybe they were so convinced that nothing could happen to that ship that they had gone off to talk to some of their friends, or maybe they had gone to the bar for a drink, or maybe they were asleep. I don't know. But even though warnings were given from the crow's nest that the iceberg was ahead, the warning was not listened to. It was to no avail. Theory said 66,000 tons of Titanic traveling at 18 knots could cut through anything. But the fact is, when the Titanic hit that iceberg at 18 knots, it was like a gigantic hammer blow equaling 947,000 foot tons. My friend, many a man is placing his hopes of eternity on theory rather than, uh, rather than fact. Theory says, no one will ever know my sin. But the fact is, be sure your sins will find you out. Theory says, I can make it to heaven on my good works. But the fact is, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy hath he saved us. Theory says, if we're put in hell, we'll have a second chance to repent. But the fact is, and the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and forever. Theory says a God of love will not send a man to hell. But the fact is, and in hell, 
he lift up his eyes, being in torments. This voyage showed the folly of unbelief. There was the folly of ignorance. Do you realize that from the very moment that that ship left the harbor, a fire was in bunker number six and had been raging all the time. The psalmist David said, In sin did my mother conceive me. Whether you realize it or not, my friends, there was something wrong with man from the very moment he started out. The Bible says in the book of John, chapter 3, and verse 18, He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. There was the folly of unconcern. There were three warnings sent from the crow's nest to the officer on the bridge fifteen minutes before the Titanic struck. The officer picked up the phone, but it was too late. It was just seconds before the crash. There was the folly of unpreparedness. There were twenty lifeboats. There was a capacity of fifty-eight. That means that there was a total capacity of eleven hundred. Twelve hundred forty souls on that ship to begin with could not possibly be saved. There had been no details of seamen assigned to each boat. The boats had no provisions. Some had no water stored. Some were without sails or compass. In some boats, the plugs in the bottom had been pulled out. That reminds me of religion without Christ. It will not hold against the raging storms of time. And then there was the folly of the pleasure-mad crowd. A great portion of the passengers were drinking, dancing, gambling, having a great time, not conscious that the ship would soon sink. A group of gamblers went, on, uh, went out on deck to look around and then returned to their cards. Many went on to bed with confidence in the Titanic's ability to stay afloat. Do you realize that there were actually a group of people out there on that ship chipping pieces of the ice, having snowball fights? Others were taking hunks of that ice to their stateroom so that they could show their friends in New York what an iceberg looked like. Many went on to bed with confidence in the Titanic's ability to stay afloat, and they only responded when stewards actually broke into their staterooms and literally wrestled them from their beds. Others joked about the life preservers. Some actually put the life preservers on and danced around the decks, laughing, mocking, enjoying themselves in that moment of death. My friends, many a man today is joking his way through life, not realizing that he stands in slippery places, even at the brink of hell. Many refuse to get into the lifeboats, thinking that they would just get cold and dirty. John Jacob Astor was asked, Man, where is your life belt? And he said, I didn't think there would be any need for it. There's many a man in this world who one day will stand at the judgment bar of God, and in that day they will be asked this question, What did you do with Jesus? which is called the Christ. And I'm afraid that many are going to say, I didn't think I'd need him. And then there was the futility of procrastination. 
Many would have been saved if they had only gotten into the lifeboats. Because of a series of explosions, the race to the remaining lifeboats became a stampede. Many of the men who perished in the ship could have bought it, but they didn't have enough money to buy a seat in the lifeboats. The separation was one of the most horrible of thoughts. Fathers separating from children, mothers from daughters, husbands from wives, was one of the most horrible things that you could possibly imagine. Actually, children were literally torn from the arms of their parents. Women were literally torn from the arms of their husbands. Many of them were literally thrown into the lifeboats. An eyewitness account said that a man stood with his 12-year-old son, and that boy clutched his father's waist. Several times, various people came by and said to the man, Don't you think that you ought to put the boy in the lifeboat? Because, you see, my friends, it was women and children first. But the little boy would scream and clutch his father and hold on to him every time someone tried to get him to get into the lifeboat. Finally, that father put his arms around the little boy, and the little boy clutching his father, they went down with the ship. When I thought about that, it seemed to me that that was a tremendous example of love. But the longer I meditated on it, I realized that it was not an example of love. Some years ago, on the way to church, one Sunday morning, I saw a man whose wife is a Christian who attends our church faithfully. I saw the man driving along with his little boy standing on the seat beside him, and the little boy had his arm around his father's neck. It looked as if they were getting ready to go fishing, and as I saw that scene, the thought came to me, boy, he really loves that little boy. And then all of a sudden, when I realized that he was taking him fishing instead of to Sunday school, I realized that he doesn't really love him. No father really loves a little boy who doesn't tell him about Jesus and keep him out of an eternal hell. You may clothe your children. You may educate them. You may give them the finest of medical attention. You may see, it, see to it that they have all of the toys and gadgets of life. But my friends, if you do not expose them to the gospel of Jesus Christ and they die and go to an eternal hell, you don't really love them. In reality, you hate them. I tell you, if that father had done the right thing, he would have taken that boy and he would have literally thrown him into the lifeboat. One of the strange phenomena about the sinking of the Titanic was the fact as the ship went down, those who were out in the lifeboats actually heard the strains of near my God to thee as the band played. It was the same band that had been playing the ragtime of the day and the jazz songs for the people to dance to. But now, in the moment of death, they turned their thoughts toward God and eternity. Why shouldn't they play Nearer, my God, to thee. It was as if they were playing their own funeral dirge. 
that huge ship had now become a coffin. And it seemed as if God, who measureth the waters in the hollow of his hand, had sent his angels to be the pallbearers. And as they lowered that huge casket down beneath the murky waters, the band played its own funeral song. Near, my God, to thee, near to thee, even though it be a cross that raiseth me, still all my song shall be near, my God, to thee, near, near to thee. They tell us that they also played a song called Autumn that is found in the Episcopal hymn book. God of mercy and compassion, look with pity on my pain. Hear a mournful, broken spirit prostrate at thy feet complain. Many are my foes and mighty, strength to conquer I have none. Nothing can uphold my goings but thy blessed self alone. Savior, look on thy beloved. Triumph over all my foes. Turn to heavenly joy my mourning. Turn to gladness all my woes. Live or die or work or suffer. Let my weary soul abide in all changes whatsoever, sure and steadfast by thy side, when temptations fierce assault me, when my enemies I find, sin and guilt and death and Satan all against my soul combined, hold me up in mighty waters, keep my eyes on things above, righteousness, divine atonement, peace, and ever lasting love. Think of it. The same band that played everything you could imagine when it came time to die, their thoughts were on God. My friends, I've preached many funerals down through the years. Some have been notorious sinners. Some have been exceedingly wicked. But in every instance, the family has said, we want the solos to sing one of the great old hymns of the faith. My friends, I have an idea that if the God of the Bible is good enough to die by, he ought to be good enough to live by. A strange thing took place in the sinking of the Titanic. Do you realize that there was another ship ten miles from this fateful event? It's hard to believe. Later in the senatorial investigation, they asked the captain of that ship why he didn't come to the Titanic's rescue. And he said, I didn't realize the ship was sinking. They says, didn't you hear their calls for help? He says, no. At midnight, I turned my wireless off and went to sleep. He says, but didn't anybody on the ship 
See the Titanic only ten miles away from you sinking? And he said, we didn't know it was sinking. Because you see, as deck by deck went below the waters, and the lights went out one by one, he said, we thought the ship, faster than us, was sailing off into the night. Oh, my friends, many a man is sinking with a Christian a few feet away, but they're asleep. They're asleep. O oh, church, awaken! Lost men all around us are dying and going to an eternal hell. And unless we come to the rescue, it'll be forever too late. Dr. Peter Conley, who has gone on to be with the Lord now, was a great preacher from Ireland. He was a great soldier of the cross. He was living when the Titanic sank. And he told the story that an old preacher was on board the ship he was thrown out into the cold waters of the Atlantic. And remember that those waters were freezing. Mushy waters of ice. And when the old preacher realized that he couldn't save his own life, he literally swam from lifeboat to lifeboat, raft to raft, piece of debris to other pieces of the ship. And he would cry out and say to the people, Trust Christ. Take him as Savior. Receive him into your heart. Call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. And finally, when the old preacher could stand it no longer, he started to sink. And when he started to sink, he cried out and said, I'm going down. But then all of a sudden, with one last great effort, he says, no, no, I'm going up. And with that, he breathed his last breath. One man was asked, why don't you get into the lifeboat? But he was heard to say, I'll take a chance and stay here. After all, it was an unsinkable ship. This reminds me of an event that took place many years ago. My wife and I sat at midnight in the old coffee house at the Claypool Hotel. Across from me sat a venerable old judge. The frost of many winters was upon his brow. He had served under seven presidents. He had been the head over the entire Virgin Islands. I reached across and took his hand. I said, Sir, won't you take Jesus Christ as your Savior tonight? And I'll never forget those steel blue eyes looking at me. And then he said, I'll take 
my chances. And then I said, But sir, without Jesus Christ, you don't have a chance. You don't have a chance. As I told you, there was a senatorial investigation. I'm not sure exactly why. Of course, there is always an investigation of ships that sink at sea, but in this case, because of the tremendous loss of lives, there was a senatorial investigation. A man by the name of Herbert John Pittman, who was the third officer, testified before that investigating committee. I do not know why they ask him this question, but one of the senators said, Mr. Pittman, can you describe to this committee the screams of those who went down with the ship? Mr. Pittman, on hearing that question, literally buried his face in his hands and began to sob uncontrollably. In a little bit, when he regained his composure, the senator said, Mr. Pittman, we realize that this is a tremendous ordeal for you, but we're trying to learn everything we can about the sinking of the Titanic. Maybe your testimony will help us in the future. Mr. Pittman regained his composure, and then he said, Sirs, the best way I can describe it is like this. It was just one long, continuous moan. One long, continuous moan. When I heard that, the thought came to me, what if there was a place on this earth where you could listen in to hell, and then there was a senatorial investigation and they asked this question, Sir, can you describe the sounds of hell? I believe the same answer would be given. Sirs, it's just one long, continuous moan. Tomorrow, he promised his conscience. Tomorrow, I mean to believe. Tomorrow, I'll think as I ought to. Tomorrow, my Savior receive. Tomorrow, I'll conquer the habits that hold me from heaven away. But even his conscience repeated one word, and only one today. Tomorrow, 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 thus day after day it went on. Tomorrow, 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 till youth like a vision was gone, till age in his patience had written the message of fate on his brow, and forth from the shadows came death with a pitiless syllable, Now. What will you do with Jesus? The call comes low and clear. The solemn words are sounding now in your listening ear. Immortal life is the question, 
and joy through eternity, then what will you do with Jesus? Oh, what will your answer be? They 
had found time to die. And oh, what a weeping and wailing as the lost were told of their fate. They cried. But their prayer was too 